Emily Dryden and Harry Collins. This is a cautionary tale of our times, a murder televised for immediate showing on the news, a killing caused by the intensely frustrating, maddening and complacent nanny state, an eccentric assassin who was featured, encouraged and, in the view of his victim's colleagues, irresponsibly wound up by sensationalist news media men willing to risk anyone else's life and limb for the sake of a good story. Villains and their friends will sometimes cheekily resort to political and moral pressure group tactics to achieve their ends. Few North Londoners will forget the extraordinary procession of villains' women folk protesting against the conviction of Reg Dudley and Bob Maynard for the Islington Torso murder. The fact that many of their fellow villains deeply resented Ronald Fright's acquittal and Bob Maynard's conviction in that case doesn't make it any the less paradoxical that police should have protected a protest march in support of two men convicted of murder, led by one woman who had stood in the dock with them, and others who were not accustomed to seeing law enforcement as anything but evil interference with their menfolk's daily work. But Albie Dryden, rightly convicted murderer, has a fan club of perfectly respectable citizens. SAD, S-A-D, the supporters of Albert Dryden, assert that local authority bureaucracy may reasonably be seen as driving this man to murder. There are responsible and law-abiding councillors from Conservative and Labour parties who aver that planning officer Harry Collinson had turned himself into such a humourless, unfeeling, rigid, stickling, petty-minded enforcer of the small print of regulations that his murder was a service to the public, his death was a necessary obliteration rather than a crime to be subject to moral judgment, that the victim of thin-blooded town hall officialdom routed, racing pell-mell away through the ditches along with their police escort, leaving the head bureaucrat shot by a gentle-faced, blue-eyed, bearded eccentric, was an inspiration for us all. Other murderers have enjoyed a modicum of public sympathy for their predicament, Ruth Ellis, the Reverend John Watson, Derek Bentley. But Albert Dryden enjoys something quite different. People support him for committing a murder. I can hardly believe that I'm a year older than Albert Dryden. His fluffy silver beard and benign pink face have given him the nickname Santa Claus, even though at the time of his conviction he was only a little over fifty. He was a steel worker at Consett, as his family had been for three generations, until the Thatcherite Revolution brilliantly revitalised the steel industry by closing most of it down. Albert Dryden found himself with a £15,000 redundancy payment and no job. He wasn't deeply distressed. He's not a married man, so there was no ambitious wife wanting washing machines or growing kids needing ever larger shoes to consider. He did, however, have dependents. His brother Alan is mentally handicapped, and Albert cared for him seriously and responsibly. His mother, Nora, was deeply loved, and it was a project started in her interest that led to Harry Collinson's downfall. Although Albert Dryden was convicted and sentenced for life, I'm not sure whether one can refer to events that have made him a folk hero as a downfall. Prior to his redundancy, Albert was known mainly for the harmless but startling eccentricities of an individualist who was good with his hands and willing to make unexpected things. At the time of the first moon landings, Albert started collecting explosives and scrap metal and designed his own rockets. He let them off on Stanhope Moor in Durham, and they were jolly successful. They didn't go into orbit or reach the moon, but they did show up on the radar screens that try to prevent flying accidents or surprise enemy attacks in British airspace, and that's a damn sight better than anything I could ever build. Albert was summonsed and told to stop firing personal missiles up into the air traffic stratosphere. Let's be quite clear. Albert intended no harm by his private space program. It wasn't a nuclear disarmers protest against Defence Department radar, let alone a terrorist threat to airliners. It was, in his opinion, an experiment done in the interests of science. That opinion, you may feel, shows why he had another reputation in County Durham, as a bit of a head case. Harmless, pleasant enough, well-intentioned, a decent man from a decent family, 
but a man who could interpret his perfectly understandable small boy delight in letting off bangs, coupled with enough technical knowledge to know how to make those bangs propulsive, to interpret this as science rather than fun. A man who wouldn't really see things quite the way other people did, who might at times put forward positively unrealistic readings of life. Albie had another slightly odd hobby. He collected old cars, preferably rather big old American ones. He told friends that he intended to use parts of some to construct the longest car in England. I suspect that he'd seen early pictures of American stretch limousines and enjoyed the idea of these glorified super cabins. It was a harmless ambition, and I'm sure the ex-steel worker whose rockets had hit the radar screens would have managed to weld together something pretty extraordinary. Whether it would have passed its M.O.T., on the other hand... But stop. I'm talking like Harry Collinson, and trying to restrict the creative human spirit by the application of dead rules and regulations. Albert told some friends of another ambition he enjoyed after his redundancy. He thought he'd like to be a private eye and drive a pink Cadillac. Well, good on you, Albie. So would lots of us. The climate of Southern California is much nicer than Britain's, and the notion of a Philip Marlowe life with booze and dames to compensate for the tension and occasional saps across the ear is appealing, especially with that pink caddy thrown in. Yeah, we can dream if we want to. But Albert's impressive, and I mean impressive, achievement was his determination to do something for his mother with his redundancy money. Nora Dryden was around eighty, and like many old ladies found stairs a problem. Albie wanted a comfortable new bungalow for her, and since he could and would build it himself with his own bare hands, fifteen thousand pounds gave him enough money to get to work. Albert and his family had long lived at the Grove Estate, company workers' houses alongside the old British steel plant at Consett. With the plant closed and fresh, humpy turf replacing it, Albert hoped to get a plot of land there for building. It was not to be. But Albie knew of another plot of land up for sale, a little piece of the countryside out at Buttsfield. A small, unused field, with more fields and trees as its surroundings. He bought the land and set out to erect his bungalow. He wasn't stupid. He knew he needed planning permission, and so he made the acquaintance of Derwentside District Council's principal planning officer, Harry Collinson. Let's look for the good side first. A conservative from the Derwentside District Council's minority group said, Harry was a quiet man, not very open, certainly a good officer for the council, and he did love his trees. Harry's boss was more cautious and tended to defend the job rather than the man. I didn't know him a great deal. He was devoted to his children. I've heard that he was deeply disliked by some people. It wouldn't surprise me. He was very much by the book. Oh, yes, but it's a difficult subject planning, you know. A lot of people, if they don't get their way, then, well, they've got a grudge, haven't they? Planning's called development control. And if you use the word control, you'll be saying no to people, won't you? Hmm. Pretty faint praise, wouldn't you say? Pretty much the sound of a petty official defending the ways of petty officialdom. You and me, we're wrong, because we don't like being told what we can or can't do with our own property. The planning officers, they're right, because the rule book says so. And how on earth can we be so mean as to deplore the fact that 27 different types of official could interfere with the way we kept our homes? Were we stupid enough to think an Englishman's home was his castle? If we're to have a proper and presentable little suburbia, then it would jolly well better fall into line and become the same sort of ticky-tacky box as the one next door. What do you want to be different for? Right-thinking people stamp out anybody different. Oh, dear, I've run out of the nice things that people said about Harry Collinson. That conservative councillor who said Harry loved his trees also said, If you asked him a question, you never seemed to get the right answer. They just didn't seem to consider the human element. They say you have to stick to the rules. That's what happened on Derwent's side. It just happens all the time, and people are fed up with it. A less rigid approach with Dryden might have been helpful. A Labour councillor from Tau Law, who had himself been a chief landscaping officer and might be expected to approve of planning in principle, was far more scathing. 
If there was any way to obstruct you, Harry Collinson would find it, he said. My immediate reaction when I heard the news was that Albert's done do inside a favour. May you bloody well rot in hell, Harry. Believe me, hate's not the word for Harry Collinson. Core. Strong stuff. Yet, prima facie, Harry Collinson was confronted with quite an outrageous demand when Albert Dryden popped up and proposed to erect a plain, gabled, boxy, breeze-block bungalow topped with red-roofing felt tiles in the middle of open countryside. Bear in mind that Albert's idea of a good enough fence for the time being was upended packing cases that his hobby was collecting and gutting big old cars, and that he would rapidly surround anywhere he lived with rusting automobile corpses. And you can see that he was proposing just the sort of eyesore that most of us hope planning departments will firmly prevent. Only Albert was determined. He was willing to go back and back and back to Harry's office, demanding, claiming his rights, offering changes, becoming such a familiar figure that he even heard the bureaucrat's personal grievance about having been passed over for a promotion his chiefs hadn't thought he really wanted. Somewhere in the course of the endless conversations between the eccentric, determined, independent creator and the inflexible, rules-loving office-holder, Harry Collinson did something which sounds uncharacteristic and certainly proved dangerous. He made a little joke. If Albert wanted to build anything in the middle of unspoilt landscape, he remarked, it could only be three foot high. Albert needed no more encouragement than that. He was both a head case and a determined man who knew how to use his hands. He interpreted the remark as permission to build something that didn't project more than a yard above ground level. So he started digging and he turned most of his tiny property into an enormous pit. He started building, and created a hideous bungalow in the pit that projected just three feet above the ground. Ah! Well, now, what would you expect a planning officer to do in such a case? He ordered Albert to pull it down immediately, of course. Albert challenged, argued, filled in forms, demanded an inquiry, pulled out every bureaucratic stop he could understand to retain his property. And hideous though it might be, I guess many of us have some feeling for a man who had done all that work single-handed after misunderstanding a joke. A truly humane public official might have tried to see whether he could find some compromise, some way of landscaping Albert's erection with surrounding trees, so that it didn't poke quite so obscenely into England's green and pleasant land. But Harry Collinson never, never, never would have dreamed of such a dereliction of duty. Even though the press picked up the story, and Albert's bungalow became a highly publicised local issue, even though bureaucrats dread publicity and never want their decisions to become open and polarising political questions, Harry Collinson steamrolled on. While the battle of forms and letters and hearings continued, Nora Dryden died. Albert firmly believed that she'd been killed by the strain of not knowing when or whether she'd ever get into her bungalow. I don't know whether he was right or not. She was 83 at the time. But her death certainly upset Albert greatly and reasonably. And it also left him with full responsibility for his handicapped brother, Alan. Mrs. Dryden's death caused one other change in the saga of Albert's bungalow. He decided if he couldn't keep his mother in it, he would keep chickens in it. The Derwentside Conservative councillor speaks again. People said he was eccentric. Surely if you want to live in the countryside and have a few hens, that doesn't make you eccentric. Well, no, that doesn't. Not on its own. But I wonder whether the councillor ever went out and looked at Albert's property. I've seen pictures of the horrible house in the hole, with one overturned car and one bonnetless car on the verge beside Albert's pit, with a gangplank resting on a brick from the grass to the roof across the bare, weedy pit with its builder's rubble lying around. A little flock of Rhode Island reds scratching and messing all over. It seems just what it needs to be something you'd really want to get rid of and plough over. But Albert installed the chickens. <laughs> 
And then came one more misunderstanding, one more tragedy. There was a hearing, and Albert lost it. He thought that was the end, the bungalow would have to come down, and he started taking the tiles off the roof to save time. But a letter from the council reached him, inadvertently referring to his hearing as though it were yet to come. Albert restored the tiles, under the impression that he had at least another five weeks' grace. Harry Collinson was appalled. He fixed a day to come and oversee the demolition of the bungalow personally. Albert protested furiously that this would be murdering his chickens. The RSPCA ought to have something to say about that. Harry Collinson was unmoved. The Durham Press was thoroughly enjoying this preposterous story, and Albert had sympathisers throughout the county who were starting to send threatening letters to planning officers. One of them released one of Albert's chickens in Mr Collinson's office, though I can't imagine what good that was supposed to do. The police feared a serious disturbance, and asked Harry to do his dirty demolition work under cover of darkness. But Harry refused. He wasn't like that. The law was on his side, and some of his colleagues feared that there might be real trouble. They might even be shot up by protesters with shotguns if they seemed to have taken action furtively and tricked the single-handed builder. The only precaution Harry Collinson accepted was going very early, at 8.15 a.m. before Albert normally went out to his property. And so, on June the 20th, 1991, a little procession came out to the field with the house in the hole. There was Mr. Collinson to serve the demolition order. There were council workers to carry it out. There were police to protect them. There were newspaper men and photographers and a TV camera crew to enjoy the fun. But they were forestalled. A journalist, wanting a statement from Albert, had let him know when the raid was planned. And Santa Claus was waiting for the demolition men. One photographer got a picture of Harry Collinson giving Albert the bad news that his handiwork was about to come down, and I'm afraid Harry is smiling, a thin-lipped, self-satisfied smirk that must have been utterly maddening to the frustrated man facing him. Albert went back to the bungalow and came out with an old revolver. It was practically a museum piece, but it worked. He pointed it at Harry Collinson, and he shot him right in front of the police and the photographers and the cameramen. They all saw it, they photographed it, they filmed it, and they ran. Police and all, they scampered for safety, leaving Harry Collinson lying in a ditch. Albert fired another shot at him, went out to the road and fired some more desultory shots, and finally gave himself up. It was our own first filmed real-life murder for television, not live like Jack Ruby's killing of Lee Harvey Oswald, but quite as dramatic. It was indefensible, and Albert was convicted without any reasonable doubts coming into play. Quite right, too. And yet... You might think my earlier snidery about Mrs. Thatcher's steel policy meant that I hated the lady and all her works. Not so. Some of her achievements were, I think, admirable. Some were nauseating. But I do, too, have a lot of sympathy with her right-wing critics who felt that her revolution didn't go far enough, didn't carry out the reforms she promised. Small businesses remained crippled by taxes. VAT and the uniform business rate left them worse off than ever before, as you could see at the end of her reign by glancing at any town high street where the traditional local retailers had gone and only the big national chains could afford to set up shop. And she didn't manage to get the bureaucrats off our backs. No doubt she wanted to. But as the case of Harry Collinson showed, they were still there with the small print to support them, until local politicians found themselves in the extraordinary situation of endorsing a murder. It makes you think, doesn't it?